Ladies and gents, boys and girls, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. My guest on the podcast today is Paul Cartwright, National Account Manager for AECO. Now, AECO are the market leader in fire and carbon monoxide detection. We're going to be talking about the values and ethos behind building safer communities, some of the ways that we do this, and how the industry of fire, smoke alarms, and detection has evolved over the years, in alignment with all the changes in legislation and all the complexities that have come along with it. There's also a really significant aspect to this with regards to corporate social responsibility that I'm hoping you'll find quite insightful. Before we jump in there with Paul, let's hear from our wider podcast family. First up is a massive shout out to our partner, William Wood Watches. Chances are you already know William Wood Watches is, but if you haven't, you'll have seen them in GQ, The Times, Esquire, Forbes, The Telegraph, BBC, The Financial Times, Men's Health, upcycling firefighting equipment and utilizing it every single component that makes up the beautiful watches. They've won the Esquire Self-Made Entrepreneur of the Year. They were chosen by GQ Men's Health as the best men's watches to buy in 2020 and 2021. And they've donated over 50,000 to international firefighting charities. Now, there's so many ways to go on and find out more about William Wood Watches. Head over to williamwoodwatches.com. Check them out on their Instagram. Check them out on their Facebook. They've got a private group if you are a member, if you have purchased one of their watches. So jump on over, take a look, whether it's the Triumph, the Valiant, the Bronze, the Chivalrous. And they've even got the Tunnel to Towers 911 watches. Honestly, if you are a fan of the emergency services if you're looking for that gift for someone whether it's a new recruit whether it's retiree get over to williamwoodwatches.com and take a look i promise you will not regret it our second part of the podcast for today's episode is the incredible hikes hikes footwear is made in europe and they are an innovative high-tech functional shoe manufacturer and they meet the highest standards all over the world they cater for the fire and rescue the medical workwear police military forestry streetwear from our tactical frontline special forces operators to our firefighters boots on the ground hikes are keeping us safe in every single way as part of their partnership with the podcast they are giving away a pair of hikes boots every single month so after the podcast be sure to jump over to our social media feeds have a look for that post get yourself on there we have given away three pairs so far we are doing it every single month so get over there check it out there is no funny details to be had so jump on over check it out hikes uk a fantastic partner of the podcast well there you have it folks that's the names in the frames for today's episode so without further ado if you're sitting comfortably let's buckle up for safety and i will see you on the other side Paul Cartwright, welcome to the Firefighters Podcast. How are you doing, boss? Yeah, great. Nice to be here. Nice to talk to you. And uh, I'll obviously see you on screen. I don't know if uh, everybody else knows they what you look like. Unfortunately, or... no. I mean, that's one point we're going to get to in the future when we're super fandangled technological masters. But at the minute, the visual is purely for mine and your pleasure. So unfortunately, everyone else doesn't get the benefit. But thank you no, for wearing fine. your birthday suit. It really suits you. You look fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I hadn't had a shirt this morning now, to be honest. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, I know. I put my tux on for nothing at all. Um, you join us today from uh, ICO, and I wanted to have you guys on because sort of community safety is such a massive aspect in so many things that we talk about when we talk about the, the emergency services and these great companies that, war- that work in and around it. Now, you guys are sort of market leaders in this area, I yeah. suppose. So to give our sort of listeners an understanding, what is the company all about and, and how do you guys deliver value? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been operating for in excess of 30 years now. We're actually our 30th, 30th anniversary last year, um, which we... <laughs> In the Berta Commons, sort of celebrated during COVID. Oh, that must have been um, terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got so many plans. So many plans. We've got we've got a marketing office. Well, marketing storage full of 30th anniversary stuff. What we were basically going to be inviting people into the office, doing lots of different events, and yeah. you know, giving away all this sort of 30th anniversary you know, binders and various other sort of pens and all this other sort of stuff. Yeah. And now we're giving it away in year 31, which a little bit. You know, it's not as good as we wanted it to be, but uh, it, it, I mean, we we did actually have a company, you know, a company event right at the start of the year, you know, year thirty. Kevin Keegan came down, talked about sort of inspiration and inspiring people, and and, and it can still kick a football. We were, <laughs> yeah. we were given away sort of signed footballs, and literally we got a you know a big room with seventy staff in there, yeah. and it was 
kicking it pinpoint to every single person in that room. There were glasses all over the table, and they were literally just kicking it straight into their hands every single time. No like, way. I'll tell it's you what, yeah. you've got to have some confidence to do it. Even when I suppose he approached the company and said, I do this thing when I come and speak, and what I do is, and they were like, um, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe or yeah. or maybe not, because like you might <laughs> you might start getting glass in every yeah. respect. No, I'm really good at it. Seriously, I've still got it. <laughs> God, yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Absolutely. They start doing it, and it's like first person, we're like front table. Yeah, it's fine, you know. And then it just start going further and further back, and it's like this. This is going to be carnage, but literally every <laughs> single one. And he's and he's, he's great, you know. I mean, he, he talks about inspiration and working, and you know the, the success he's had in you know in business. And he's it's great to hear when you you know something a little bit different than than bringing someone in, sort of talking, you know, trying to inspire you from a different sector sometimes can seem a little bit odd. Yeah. Um, but it's it very, very so self-deprecating. You know, the companies he's worked for, you know, he listed out three, three or four companies he worked for. You know, really, really, really funny and good and, yeah, we're great. So we, we did have that opportunity to celebrate just just before sort of COVID and everybody went into shutdown. But, but yeah, digressing, we've, we've been around for sort of 31 years. The, the company was set up by an individual. He wanted to work in electrical distribution. So he set up his own little business. Effectively fell into a, a distribution sort of agreement with EI Electronics. Um, they were an advert in the paper, and basically he responded to it. Um, surprisingly, they gave him the contract. You know, he was effectively working out of his own house with a, a small lockup, and they gave him sole distribution rights to the UK. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, no contract. Basically, gentleman's agreement. Mm. They shook hands and, right, you will get it. Isn't you know, there, at any point just, they could just have to double it. click on that, sorry. So we're talking 30 years yeah. ago. So we're talking you know, at the beginning of the 90s. And that really was mm. the time when independent businesses were really being empowered because you could, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not, um, no one's trying to pull the wool over somebody else's eyes, but you really could stand toe to toe with some of these massive companies and offer and demonstrate yourself to be, you know, a company that really adds value irrespective of your size. So this was this, you know, consummate professional yeah, who managed to get himself yeah. that sole distribution. That's massive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, the timing, you know, everything, everything's about timing. I think sometimes, you know, the, the company, the EI Electronics, the company themselves, has gone through a massive transition. They've been set up by GE over in Ireland oh, really? um, so 50 years ago to make electronic components basically to serve the European market. And that's where the EI comes from. It, Emerald, it was basically an Emerald Isle project for GE, uh-huh. and they, that was the sort of gateway for them into Europe. Um, they took a decision to sort of pull out the pull out the market, basically move, you know, close the factory down. Um, it gave the, the the management the option to take a management buyout, which they subsequently did with you know support to the banks and the banks sort of trusted them enough to let them sort of run with it. And three guys basically took over the company and, and kept everybody in employment. I mean that was a big part of the the reason they wanted to. Be. They were working there. They worked alongside a huge amount of people, um, largest indigenous sort of workforce in the south of Ireland, yeah. um, and they were all basically going to be made redundant and you know look to find another job. So they, they were allowed to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they were making effectively small clouds of black and decker at the time. It, that's that's the that was a sort of part of the business what were really thrive. And uh, they set up on their own and basically renamed the company EI Electronics. You know, they retained the Emerald Isle sort of principle. Everything comes out with an EI name on it, including in in the UK. I mean, they've, they've got sort of businesses throughout throughout Europe, France, Germany, and all of those are called EI. You know, so it's EI France, EI Germany, and then we've got ACO in UK, which is entirely different, <laughs> but it's, it's synonymous with the name of the, of the brand. You know, yeah. we've built the brand through ACO in the UK with far, by far the most successful part of the business in terms of, you know, turnover and, and, yeah. and everything. But it, it was timing. I mean, they, they, were, they, they gave him the agreement. Like I said, they were not in sign. They could have pulled out at any point when they started getting bigger and said, right, we're just going to deal with yeah. You know, we're going to allow someone else to do it, um, but that never happened. And basically, the, the King's Cross fire sort of occurred at the time, and people's perception of fire and the dangers of fire grew massively. You know, the industry grew. We got some significant competitors at the time uh, coming from abroad. Um, but Ken Ainsworth, who set up the company, that's where the A comes from, from in ACO, it's Ainsworth Company. He 
basically when I, when I came into the business so 20 years ago, the business was still sort of, you know, doing well, but, you know, less than 10 million pounds turnover a year. It worked, you know, good, reasonable size so SME basically mm. supplying various products. Smoke alarms were a key part of it, but we're also supplying lighting and various other things um, into the electrical distribution market. When I came into the business after all the interviews and eventually turned up for the business for the first day, uh, we did a bit of an induction first day and then went to see Ken in his office. Uh, we're a very small office, yeah. you know, uh, big, you know, fairly big sort of building, but Ken had got one of the smallest offices in the building anyway. In his opinion, he didn't need a big office. You know, he was in and out of business. I, I still remember to this day, you know, that it was basically welcome to the family. You know, you're, you're here now. You know, you're part of the family. Um, and that's what we want to retain. That's what we want to keep in the business. We want to keep a family business. Everybody should know everybody here. And, and I'd not really heard that before in, in, in all this time, you know, I, I know, I'd only been working sort of 10 years prior to going into that, but I'd never heard that before. You know, I'd never spoken to the guy right at the top of the business, basically saying, welcome to the family, you know. Every time there's a, a major tragedy, all of a sudden people decide they want to have smart clubs again. And it's like, you know, one, one of the things we talked about, you know, a few weeks ago when we talked about doing this, it's like, what, what drives the business? What drives the business is basically the idea that you're keeping people safe. Um, and, you know, what is a smart club to people? Well, you know, a smart club should be something what's on the ceiling, what they never think about, apart from once a month and they're just testing it. But it should never operate. It should just be on the ceiling, doing nothing, until that, un- you know, unfortunate day where it does need to do something. Yeah. And unfortunately, people need reminding about that every now and again. And, it tends to be those incidents, you know, we've had obviously Grenfell's in everybody's mind still mm. now, but, you know, over the years, there's been various incidences where all of a sudden everybody wants a smoke alarm or everybody wants a carbon monoxide alarm. And, you know, our job is basically to prevent that from happening, you know, mm. to have smoke alarms and see alarms on in people's houses doing the job. And when these things occur, people think, um, yeah, yeah, thank God I've got a smoke alarm on my ceiling. If it ever happened to me, I know I'll be safe. You know, I know I'd be a lot safer than if I didn't have one. There are occasions where, you know, smoke alarms, you can have a smoke alarm in every room. Mm. You know, we've, we've talked about, I've been to events where people have talked about sprinklers yeah. and there were this sort of urban myth about nobody's ever died when there's been a sprinkler in a property. And the, the sprinkler associations say these things, you know, that's not true. No. You know, <laughs> Absolutely people, not. you know, people will, unfortunately, if they're covered in alcohol and then fall onto a cooker, which is, one of the occasions, yeah. basically, you know, the, the sprinkler won't save that person because they, they, they're the source of the fire. You know, it's just being as safe as you possibly can be in your own, you know, and if you've got smart clowns in, you know, in the wrist rooms and in the escape rooms, all, all the areas of the property where you need to have them in, you, you make it, you, you by far increasing your chances of getting oh, yeah. out of that. It's all about that early detection, early awareness, giving yourself, you know, stacking the odds in your favour, effectively. Yeah. We're never going to completely remove human error. But I wanted to take you back just for a second to to when, you know, the, the company first started, I suppose, in the UK. And, mm-hmm. you know, we spoke about a couple of key incidents there. When do you think, at somewhere along that timeline, did people's personal accountability start transitioning? Because I, when I think, you know, back 70s and 80s, when I think about my timeline or the, the timeline of just the general public, there was a point, and I don't know when it is, you'll know perhaps far better than me, when the transition happened from, well, if there's a fire, we're just going to ring the, the fire brigade. Or if the worst happens, we'll just ring the fire service. And we still do that, of course. But yeah. when do you think people really started thinking about taking a bit more personal accountability it wasn't they had a lack of trust in the emergency services but they thought by the time i mean we all respond within 10 minutes or whatever but we we need a bit more notice than that it could already be game over within the first two or three minutes people have seen the videos and how quickly fire yeah. spreads in the home when yeah. do you think that sort of mindset started happening because did, did it align with the growth of the business at all i think to some degree it did i think like i said it, it, there were a huge growth of the business during well in the aftermath of the king's cross fire i mean yeah. you know and that we went that went to domestic fire no. you know that the but it was just the idea of dying in fire you know it were in people's consciousness you know the idea that you know smoke will kill you you know people got a lot more information about the, the effects of smoke you know most people didn't actually burn to death in a fire it was People think you can just cough, 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 and as long as you can get out, you'll be all right. Just don't go anywhere near the fire. 
But you know what? Yeah. Most people, and I'm just going to butcher the statistics, but most people don't get anywhere near the fire, the fire deaths. Mm-hmm. It is the smoke that's killed them long, yeah. long, long before we or anybody else finds a, a charred body. You know, that they've been gone mm-hmm. long before that. When you see the mm-hmm. autopsies, it's almost always smoke inhalation. I think, I think this is it. And I think just people got a lot more information on that. They be, became aware of it. There were a lot more public information. You know, we, we don't see the same level of public information. I don't think we see the same level of public information films out in the market that we used to back in back in the 80s and 90s. I don't think I we mean, do. And also, I think a lot of people are very, very clever about data and how we cut mm-hmm. data and how we perceive data. And I think people are led astray by very cleverly worded marketing data. So, yeah, it, it can yeah. give an, a, a feeling that things aren't as transparent as they once were. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I just I just remember back to the old days of Charlie and basically telling me how to, you know, cross the road and the green cross code man and things. And, yeah. you know, they, they're, all, they're, they're all short shorter and sharper now that, the, you know, the drink, drinking and driving thing, adverts and things, you, you, there's certain ones you remember. But I just do not feel like there's, a, there's as many things out there today. And it's led to, it's, it's led to industry in a lot of respects to, to sort of promote this. I mean, and the, you know, the Fire and Rescue Service have, you know, been given a big job over the last, well, I don't want to say 10 years, but it feels like 10 years, doing the fire, the fire safety checks within properties, which, you know, has been a big difference over the last, you know, over these years. I think people are more aware because of that, mm. without a doubt. You know, Fire and Rescue knocking on your door saying, can I just, you know, come and do a fire safety check and explaining to the people that they should have an escape plan and they should have smoke alarms on the ceilings, you know, albeit, you know, all the fire rescue can do from the battery smoke alarms. I think as much as you're sort of giving credit to the fire and rescue service, I actually think they've learned a lot from um, external companies and things like that because... I think time's gone past and speaking to a lot of retired members of the fire service, stuff like that, we were heavily focused on that reactive emergency aspect. We were an emergency service and we didn't necessarily do as much. And in some areas of the UK and globally, we didn't really do any preventative work. We like going into schools and, you know, teaching stop, drop and roll and all that sort of stuff. But there's kind of this concept that when people reached adulthood, um, it was kind of it was their responsibility, and it was more difficult. And it always is to try and give guidance and/or advice to an adult. Sometimes they're less receptive; they're not as impressed by the big red fire engines. Um, so it's finding those trigger points and relying on companies such as yourselves to really give that that accurate data. Um, and you, you spoke a lot about safer communities there. I wanted to really just zoom in on that and how the the, the more sort of holistic ways that we look at building safer communities because you guys do a lot that is indirectly associated with the sector and indirectly associated with the business. But it really is over and above what perhaps people would expect a non-government funded entity to be doing, because you do a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's, yeah, it's driven from the top. You know, we, we've, we've got an MD who's very keen on, 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 on CSR, on social value and community and social relationship. A lot of companies, you know, it, it is a, one of those KPIs, what companies set themselves, that we need to do more social value. But it's a lot of companies what are not as heavily involved in, you know, in safety as we are. You know, every, you know, it might, the banks might be social value plans and various other things. But from our perspective, you know, we're, we're selling a life safety product. Um, it's nice, isn't it? But it does feel weird when you see companies like that doing it. It's a bit like you, it looks like they're being forced to do it or they're just doing it because they think they should do it. There's no real yeah. authenticity or correlation to what their mission I and think, their values I think you're right. are. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you, yeah, you do look at the look at some of the, you know some of the things where it's you know there's an article just put up saying yeah we're just giving ten thousand pounds of the ten billion pounds profit we've made this year we're giving ten thousand pounds to a local charity and it's that's you, great. You know, you just that's feel great. like yeah, just do it, but you don't need to. You yeah. don't need to have that. feels weird. But from I mean from our, four years ago now we had a we had a company conference but you know every year we have a company conference and get all the staff literally the whole team together in a room and and, and the various things it, it turns into more it's more of a team building event as opposed to a sort of conference con- self congratulatory sort of thing we're having a good year again and all this we don't we don't do any of that and uh, but four years ago we specifically put everyone in close the business down put everyone into a room and said we need to basically create the value is what we want to. You know, all ascribed to, you know, a, a day to day, every day. Let's just spend a day and let's figure out what the values are, you know, of this company. So, you know, we'll give ourselves a, you know, a company tagline, but we'll also set some key values. And, you know, we set, we, we decided upon sort of six key values effectively. The idea were we basically we'll put everybody in a room and set, set, separated everyone into sort of small groups of 10 people. 
and like, just come up with all the things you want people to, to do. You know, you want people to be within the business. You know, what do you want to be? What's, what's the best version of yourself mm. doing within the business? Get all these things up. And, then, you know, we should be able to sort of pigeonhole, pigeonhole all these things into sort of six key values if we want to sort of subscribe to. Uh, and we spent the whole day doing it. The whole company were involved in doing it. You know, there were no leaders and teams. They were basically, everyone sat around the table just coming up with ideas and, you know, Basically, you know, examples being, you know, everyone should be accountable for everything they do. You know, every, you know, they should show accountability for the work so. that they do. They should be, you know, we should have trust right across the business. All these little things, and then just basically put them into pigeonholes and say, right, these are the values. And one of the key ones, what really, you know, the trust, passion, all these other things, you, you know, you'd see them across a lot of businesses. You know, teamwork, accountability, all these things would be across the business, but safer communities was one what sort of just sprung out of nowhere really in some respects mm. you know we you, so we've got you know we've got trust we've got passion we've got accountability it's teamwork sharing genius is another one which you know it, it were a name we had to put to it but the idea is you know if don't keep things to yourself yeah you know, if, 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 you know, if you know that's a really really good one people that hoard yeah. information out of fear yeah. of you know being dropped or something like that it's amazing what you can achieve when you don't mind who gets the credit for it and it's such a, a key part of what we what we're trying to do as a business. You know, we talk about leadership and you know the idea of protecting your position. You know, you you know you know there's a you know there's a promotion coming up somewhere. You know, within the business, and you know you've got all this information. What would be great when you take to a presentation? What you should be doing is sharing that information. You know, there could be better people within the business who mm. deserve that. You know, who, who are better for the business. You, you may feel you deserve that promotion more than anybody else. You work really hard for the business. You have been there the longest, but are you still the best person for that position? And, mm. you know, in a, in a lot of cases, that's probably no. Yeah. You know, you might want it for your own personal gain, but that's not the best thing for the business. The, the right person for that role is the best person for the business. If you're sharing your genius and you're supporting your colleagues, the business will move forward. And in turn, you will see the rewards from the business moving forward. That's, that's the silly thing, you know. You, if you're holding the business back for, for, for personal gain, eventually you're going to lose out anyway yeah. so you know like the sharing genius and, and and the safe communities were two what really weren't in my mindset when we originally were looking at you know look, looking at all these values and you, once you start hearing all these little things what form part of that sharing the genius and, and safe community you realize yeah these have got to be with the our key values these have got to be things we've got to work on every single day to grow the business you know we are a commercial entity so we are you know we do want to sell smoke loans but why do we want to sell smoke loans why does all 68 people within the business why do they get up in the morning they come into work we don't want them just coming to work and going home and now and forgetting about it we want them thinking about what they're doing every day and what the what contribution they're making to society we, we don't work like the hours basically it's just people in the business three quarters an hour early half an hour early every day because they want to be at work and they want to be doing something. They want to be up to something. And it's the same at night. There's no clock watching where, you know, a buzzer goes off and all the shares go up <laughs> and everything. You know, yeah. You know, you'll, you'll be sat at your desk working on something and look up and realize it's like quarter to six. Yeah. But you're not knowing it's time to go because everybody else is still sat at the desk doing something. Or, yeah. you know, we've got, we've got sort of late facilities in the office. We've got a gym. We've got it's a games room and various other things. So people do turn up and, go to the gym early before work or they're staying after work as well it just removes that sort of clock watching thing altogether people are just there being part of something mm. um, and yeah you know everybody gets paid at the end of the week you know at the end of the month but it's, it feels like you're doing a lot more than just going to work mm. um, and but it's how we then start delivering that and you know delivering on those promises we're making to one another about getting out into the community mm. um, everything you know, we've got two people within the business whose sole responsibility is CSR. Um, they're not people we've sort of gone outside and said, right, we need a CSR person. We need to put an advert in there. But basically just people within the business who've been really interested in what, what we're doing. It's like, you know, Lily went in sales, you know, Jane went in accounts. And it's like basically they moved through the business into that CSR role. You know, they effectively, that's, that's all they do. Basically, talk to schools, talk to charities, oh. talking to businesses, and promoting that 
promoting that principle throughout it, but also helping colleagues do what they want to do within with it within you know within the community. So mm. it really is a manifestation of like we said about that holistic approach to safety as well. That's a much more holistic approach of, of people's ability to add value rather than just get your head down and, and, and crack on with the work. Yeah, you can't you can't whip people into sort of submission. I don't think I don't think that's you know that's that's probably an H's it won't stop a lot of them trying. <laughs> Some people are, they're clinging on hard to the uh, to the stick, um, not realizing if they just empower people with that stronger wire, which is great to see companies like yourselves doing. I wanted to um, jump to to an aspect that I think people are slightly less familiar with because you guys are market leaders not only with the the smoke alarm and safety aspect of what you do, but also sort of carbon monoxide detection. This is something yeah. that, that the fire service have obviously um, taken on board, and it's something we try and support people with providing with detection and stuff like that but to a lot of people it's still a new concept you know you go into you go into a surprise amount of properties that haven't got smoke or much carbon monoxide detection but i would argue you go into far more that aren't having um carbon monoxide detection for, for people totally yeah. familiar with this what are the big dangers and, and and why have we even got them in our homes i think i think you, i think you're right you know there's definitely you know in terms of uptake and um, people actually going out and buying buying carbon monoxide or co as we, we tend to call them now it's the smoke alarms are the easy one you know people have just been used to they, I think they are used to having them on the ceiling now you know 90 the numbers are in a high 90 percent basically mm. of ownership you know or that's the perceived value that's a perceived number for ownership I think when you actually look at the fire statistics and the number of smoke alarms present in fires uh, being significantly lower than that, I'd suggest that, you know, there's a perceived, perceived number of smoke alarms on ceilings, but unfortunately I think a lot of them get taken down. Yeah. Um, particularly, you know, particularly if it's, you know, if, if you start nuisance beeping you know, or they start beeping, you know, and they're not really up to up to scratch, people take them down and, and get, you know, basically just get a downer on them. I mean, you know, they were, we, we've ch- you know, it's changed over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, it has changed over the years, the technology, you know, the old technology of ionization alarms. You know, they basically smell smoke. If you want to, you know, take it right back to sort of layman's terms, basically they effectively smell the, the effects of, of, of the fire. Um, so if you can smell bacon, but, you know, bacon cooking, you know, if you smell toast, the, the ionization smoke alarm would as well, and it go off, and that creates, so, you know, people getting upset with the alarms, trying to show them up all the time and eventually just take them down. Mm. Optical is the sort of standard, you know, development in those. And as the name suggests, they need to see smoke. Um, so basically only when you, you know, if you, if you really burn your toast, you know, you're producing a lot of smoke, then they'll still trigger. Yeah. But not just when you, you know, make your breakfast in the morning. So if they see smoke, basically they'll, they'll, they'll go into alarm. So the, I think people's perception of smoke alarms has, has grown over the years and the, un, the understanding has grown over the years. I think for CO, the, there's not as many incidents reported in the news. They don't see CO incidents on the news. They see fire puzzling from buildings and things and, you know, they see it. Whereas for CO incidents, even though they are reported fairly well now and they are recognised, there's not the same perception out in the market. But effectively, any, any fuel burn the plant can give off carbon monoxide. A lot of the plants are a lot safer nowadays. You do get room seal boilers and things which are much safer than they used to be. But there's still potential for them to, to produce carbon monoxide. One of those things where basically with a fire, you may well be the best detector in your house for a mm. fire. You may not have. You may have got smoke alarms upstairs, downstairs, on the landing, or where you might have got one in your living room, you might have got a heat alarm in your kitchen. Unless you work for a small alarm company or you're a fireman, you've probably not decided to fit small alarms in your bedrooms as well yeah. because, you know, it's the sort of last place you tend to start looking. You, a fire starts in your bedroom with your door shut, you're probably going to smell that smoke alarm, that, that fire before <laughs> the smoke alarm in your, in your hallway goes off. Yeah. If you've got a boiler in your bedroom and it starts giving out CO, mm-hmm. you won't know about it. Your CO alarm will tell you that there's a problem, but you'll, ne- you'll never know. You'll basically just not wake up. CO affects you that way, basically makes you drowsy. It's muscle relaxed and, and A lot of people struggle unknowingly as well, don't they, with long-term exposure to things like carbon monoxide. You know, Headaches, like you, you say, so le- lethargy and, uh, and just constant, almost subduedness that, that is, that is yeah. about people that suffer from it. And they've no idea. No, no. For years and years, I mean, I, I, my own experience in that, you know, I had auntie, you know, they, they got a lot of electric heating in the house, uh, which were very expensive. So they'd bring in a, a portable gas heater into the house and, you know, basically buy the 
bottles from the local caravan site and keep filling that up and keep using that. And, you know, and I used to stay there a lot and I used to sleep there, sleep a lot. You know, I used to fall asleep on the sofa there a lot. Run all nice and cozy, it gives off a lot of heat. So you just think, oh, it's cozy in here. You know, this is why I fall asleep. The, the window is streaming with condensation. You know, because the, the you know this buildup of carbon monoxide basically in the air was because it's not circulating. It's not you're not getting the you're not getting the air circulation in the property. And you know, I think a lot more people we we still don't test enough people for carbon monoxide poisoning. You know, we, there, there were a time where basically every every death, every unexplained death, would get a test for carbon monoxide poisoning. So you know, a lot of people put down to old age or hypothermia or various various things what you know the basically dying in their own houses yeah. i think there's a lot more cases of co poisoning than we we care to believe but as you say you know not everyone who gets co poisoning dies from co yeah. you know there, there's a lot of people suffering from long-term exposure to, to levels of co what they're not aware of and it does have a negative effect on your body you know it's affecting your nerves it's affecting your heart potentially your heart valves there's a lot of things what could be happening, what you what you don't have. And similarly, for smokers, you know, smokers are injecting CO into their body, you know, every time they, they take a cigarette. Mm. As it happens, it, you know, it probably, you know, their body's probably better served at dealing with a CO incident because they're constantly being exposed to it than, yeah. than people aren't. But it's, it's obviously having a detrimental effect on your body, having that CO. Um, the level of CO, you know, and, and I think the other thing is people don't necessarily understand how CO alarms work as well. No. You know, a smoke alarm sees a level of smoke and it goes into alarm and, and lets you know there's potentially a fire or whatever it might be what's triggering it. If the CO alarm goes off, it's going off because you're at danger from CO. Yeah. It's not going off because it's sensing CO. There's, there's different levels within a CO alarm. Mm. So it's a low, low level. level exposure, so, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. But, but at, at, at a low level, basically, the alarm will go into effectively pre alarm so you'll get a little flash on it. Once it's, once it's sensed that level, between 60 and 90 minutes, then it'll it'll sound and tell you because you've been exposed for a low level for an amount of time what's now becoming dangerous. Mm. There's a sort of mid-level where it'll go off at sort of 15 to you know, 10 to 15 minutes because you've been exposed to a, a higher level for a period of time, again, when it's become dangerous. If you get a particularly high level of CO, then it'll respond straight away. Mm. Does a lot of this come from sort of the uh, the working time, sorry to interrupt you, working time sort yeah. of regulations? Because a little bit like um, working in very cold environments or working around certain chemicals, you can have almost micro doses that don't have yeah. a, you know, there's no tangible uh, studied long-term negative effect necessarily on you. But as long as it, and I forget the terminology that they use in the legislation, it's something like, it's called a short-term activity or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that is, level of time. Yeah, yeah, that can be 15, 20, 25 minutes. But anything less than that, we're considered to be able to take a certain dose. And, and like you say, it's, it's not necessarily going to be long, long exposure. But that's when our yeah. first stage alarm sort of kicks in. That's it. That's basically it. So you'll, you'll get the flash on the alarm telling you that there's, there's CO in the air. But until it actually becomes dangerous, it won't go into alarm. And... We get a lot of calls for. I mean, we, we deal with virtually every social housing provider in the UK with our alarms. Um, a, not the same proportion of them fit CO alarms in every property, and that's something we are working on with them to, you know, to encourage more of that. Why is it just a cost aspect? Do you think? Or? It's a cost. Yeah, yeah, it's a cost. Unfortunately, with with most most safety equipment, in you know, this applies to everything really in, in terms of legislation as well, and or or deciding upon what what should be done. With legislation, people's there's a cost associated. Isn't you know, it kind people's... of a reverse thinking though? Just to just to pause there for a minute, because, and I'm not <laughs> I'm not necessarily going to advocate one or, or the other instead of, but it's like we've all got fire alarms, or we've all got the the idea of the smoke alarm. We're not we're not trying to argue the fact for that anymore. People get yeah. it, so it's like a lot of housing uh, housing association and stuff just agree with that, and they'll carte blanche put them in uh, intrinsically, say if you know wired and everything like that, but. It's pretty obvious when you have a fire, you know, it's, it's, it's really obvious. It's kind of a binary, you know, zero or one. You either have one or you don't have one. And But if you start to argue the case for a carbon monoxide alarm, they'd be like, oh, well, if we get an incident, then we'll maybe consider putting that. You probably you might have an incident now. And it's so, because they either don't get reported very well or there's exposure levels that people aren't aware of, 
it's people you walk into homes people wouldn't know if they were getting exposed to carbon monoxide no. they'd just be like oh i just no. feel drowsy or like you said about elderly population who tend to mm. use their heating yeah their heating more they will just write it off and go oh but janice is 70 you know old graham down the road he's just getting on a bit he's always been a bit like that and you're like well maybe not you know maybe if you took him you know and, and he lived in so-and-so's house that just doesn't run off any of that sort of heating yeah they would immediately yeah. perk up. Yeah, you know, there's a, yeah, and I think, it's yeah, hard to justify yeah. it for some people, and I get there's a cost <laughs> aspect to it, but yeah, I don't know how to navigate that one, and I'm sure it's it's a, it's a daily frustration in the company. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of sort of thought process. I mean, we're you know we're constantly sort of questioning the reasons why there's not a law in place for this because everyone should have. It would make it a lot easier yeah. if people just made it legislation, wouldn't they? And uh, yeah. I know we're going to get onto legislation, but sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, and like I said, we can, we, can, we can talk about that further. But in terms of, you know, when when, when a social housing provider is looking at where they're allocate, going to allocate the funds, there's certain things they, they need to consider. They, they, they've got to consider that they've got to protect the tenants and provide them with a reasonable and safe living environment uh, and risk associated with that. So there's like a long list of, sort of 29 different risks. What they need to think about cold, you know, cold homes, warm, too hot homes. There's a lot of people die from being too hot in the homes what well, you know what well, i don't think people are aware of as well a lot you know a lot more than i ever thought of as well to be honest so that that's a risk basically being exposed to you know being too hot in your home for too long wow. i never yeah, even it, given that any thought no, the, 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 we, no, when we do our so, well. safe and well visits and our welfare visits it's always the question one of the questions we ask is do you struggle to heat your home we never ask anybody if they're particularly too hot in their home i suppose yeah Oh yeah, I've had a, I've had a, I mean, heat alarms are set to trigger at 58 degrees C, which is very hot. Yeah. You know, it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be hot because you want to reduce the chances of anything else in the kitchen setting off an alarm. So you fit a heat alarm in the kitchen, but it's 58 degrees C. Unless you've got it right over the cooker in, in the wrong place, and you're actually generating that heat on a hob and it's going straight up into it, which yeah. you should never have it right directly above the cooker anyway. You should never have a nuisance alarm from heat alarms. And when we do get calls from people saying, I think the heat alarm's too close to the cook because it's going up every time I'm cooking. It tends to be because it's linked to an ionization alarm somewhere else in the property, and they just assume it's the one above the red what's triggering. Okay. But we did have one case where, you know, a, a, a heat alarm were going off in an, in, in an old woman's kitchen, and um, she got a lean to a sort of lean to conservatory on the back of the back of the kitchen, and it was basically magnifying the heat from the, you know, the way the roof was set up. It was magnifying the heat from the sun. And it was some basically getting up. cooking hot, aren't they? Absolutely ridiculous, yeah. some of them. But it's like, she, she was living in a property, you know, she was in this kitchen cooking when it were above 65 degrees ambient temperature. Bloody you hell. know, I mean, it was amazing that she were actually still alive, you know, actually, you know, you know how hot you get if you're stood outside and you're mm. in temperatures of sort of 35 degrees. Mm. It's unbearable. You were in a kitchen where it was 65 degrees. I mean, it, you know, it, it, just don't know how, how you From know. The how level survive. of, uh, you know, heat exhaustion, heat stress, yeah. becoming dehydrated, withered, um, or yeah. losing all your natural nutrients, salts, minerals, you you just become very, very weak yeah. very quickly. Yeah, that, that, that's it. So there's, there's all these risks, you know, local authorities have to think about and, and, and then basically associate budgets to, you know, uh, along with everything else they need to do, because obviously the tenant satisfaction, tenants need to be happy, they need to feel secure in the home, you know, having a front door that actually locks and, you know, windows that actually keep the heat in. There's, there's many things and there's many pressures. Well, we, we understand that. But if a fire occurs in a property, their insurance costs go up. You know, it's not just about the person in the property. It's about all the damage was done to that property as well. You know, they, we, they do a lot of damage. we make a lot of damage with water more than anything yeah. else, to be fair. Absolutely. So you can immediately see there's a cost benefit in basically. If we've got smoke alarms in their water, we're going to prevent any significant spread of fire because, you know, how many times do we, you know, do, are we aware of fires what may have started in properties what never get reported? You know, mm. people will set the, you know, set the tea towel on fire by leaving it on top of the hob or something and, the, the alarms will go off, they'll put it out, nobody will be in, none the wiser. Um, so I think, you know, prevent, you know, having smoke alarms in there prevents a lot of potential costs associated okay. with it. So they can justify it straight away. Having enough smoke alarms in there prevents that fire. Yeah, we're keeping the tenants safe, but we're also protecting our investment in terms of properties. What is the cost of the economy of a fire death? What is the cost of the economy for a CO death? I mean, I, I, I saw a presentation from Colby about 
five, six years ago, this said the cost of the economy of, of a carbon monoxide poisoning one person is about a million pounds. Really? You know, for smoke nowadays, it's, yeah. When you take into account the, the sort of investigation cost, what that person may well have earned in their lives, mm. what the, you know, the impact on their family, the impact on the NHS, everything added together, you, 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 there's a lot of hidden costs when, you know, with, with, with these things. We've just done a, uh, we, we've just commissioned a sort of research group on fire, uh, driven, you know, specifically on fire. And some of the statistics, I mean, the numbers gone from like 1 million now to something like 2.2 million pounds for someone who's actually died in a fire. You know, for, for every every sort of fire incident where someone dies, you know, the cost of rehousing people, you know, and putting mm. them, you know, in a property until the house is like, there's oh, so God. many hidden costs. There's so much more impact on people as well. You know, we, we, we you know, we're completely a sort of anonymous survey we went out to thousands of people asking them if they'd ever experienced a fire in their lifetime. You know, and and then subsequent questions about what type of property they live in, what type of tenure it is, if it's rented or, or owner occupied, and and also questions about you know if you had to make an insurance claim, you know how much time did it take you to actually deal with that insurance claim? Mm. Did you get paid out in in full? What you expected to get paid out based upon what you lost? And also the the, the mental the mental act as well. You know what what happened to them mentally after the fire. And I've, I've never really thought of it enough until you start. I mean, they're all anonymous comments, basically, from people saying, you know, if you were affected by this fire, how were you affected? And, you know, are you still thinking about, you know, what are you thinking about? And there's people saying, yeah, I had a fire in my house when I was seven years old, and I'm, I'm in my boys now, and I'm still scared. Still, you know, check everything on a nightly basis because of that fire what happened 30 odd years ago. Yeah. And it's like, that's affecting their whole life, you know. The, the idea that, you know, we've got people in properties still with no small clones. Well, we could be looking at 40 years' time. Well, they're, you know, they're suffering from something what could be entirely preventable by having the right number of small clones in their house. Where does, where does the legislation and the jurisdiction lie? And how, what's the, what's the road ahead looking like to get into that point where we've got 100% safety? It's huge. I mean, and it's a huge undertaking as well when you, when you start looking at, you know, responsibilities and, and what the legislation is actually out there. I mean, basically, the devolved nations are very different for a start. You know, we don't have UK-wide. We've got a British standard. There's a British standard out there, which is basically prescriptive guidance for anyone working, you know, or, or looking at using domestic fire detection in a property. There's a British standard what people, you know, can, can refer to and, for, and should follow basically. It gives them all the guidance they need on what is appropriate in what type of property as a minimum level. Now, we've used this for years. I mean, since 2004 where it really became sort of well, sort of well used within the industry, I suppose. And it tends to change every sort of five years or so. The last iteration was 2019. Um, and it basically, you can look down the list and it'll say, right, it's two-story property, it's rental accommodation, this is what you should fit in that property. And generally speaking, in most cases now, in all rental properties, the recommendations will be all escape routes, so hallways and landings, the principal living room, and, and the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So basically the kitchen, because obviously most fires start in kitchens. Mm -hmm. The escape routes, because ideally, you know, if the fire does start and spread, it's not there, you've, got, you want to, you've got to get out. The unfortunate thing is, in most people's perception, is we must cover the escape routes. That's it. That's people's perception. And yet, less than 1% of fires start in the escape rooms. They're always starting in another room and eventually spreading to the escape rooms. So you're going to have a fairly well set fire by the time, potentially. Mm. If you do what the fire and rescue service tell you to do and shoot your doors every night, you've got a compartmentalized room almost for a period of time for a fire to start until it spreads and gets big enough to spread through to the, to the escape rooms. So, unfortunately, you probably have a pretty well set fire by the time yeah. the small clumps go off if, you, you know, if you've only got to be escape rooms. So most fires start in kitchens. In most cases, people are up and around, so they become aware of that fire fairly quickly, and they get out. It's like only, I think it's less than 15% of actual deaths in properties are where the fire has actually originated in the kitchen. Okay. So I'm guessing it'll be the, the guy, you know, the, the people who fall asleep with chip pans on and stuff like that. They, you know, they don't wake up, and effectively that's, that's where the problem lies. All the 40% of deaths in fires are where the fire's generated in the living room, originates in the living room. So it's a huge proportion of, responsible for a huge proportion of deaths in property where the fire starts there. So it makes sense. 
that that should be the place where you have the smoke alarm. You get early warning. And guess, you know, there's, there's various reasons for that. I'm sure, you know, the reasons why this happens. You've got the soft furnishings in the room. They may generate a lot more sort of poisonous gases, what, gotcha. you know, what kill people quicker. And also, you know, the geography of where it is in the property. You know, it's, it's probably, near, you know, the last room before the front door, the living room. So if the fire starts there and gets to a point where it eventually spreads through the hallway, it's probably compromising your escape room fairly quickly. Yeah. If you get, you know, if you get an early warning for it, you'll know about the fire. You can get out before it actually gets too bad. So there's plenty, plenty of reasons for for why it should be there. And like I said, the standard sort of points you that way. So that's the British guidance, and that's the standard it gives you. We've got building regulations. So if anybody builds a new house, they they're required to fit smart alarms. So you won't get any builders basically building a new house where it'll get signed off without some detection. The unfortunate thing is that. It, that basically provides a minimum standard, which is escape routes. You've got installers who are actually installing the smart alarms who are working effectively to the British standards. That you know, if they're working for a, if they're part of any competency scheme like NIC or ECA or Selector from Scotland, they're they're expected to work to the standards. So if they want to sign a certificate based upon the work that they're doing, it has to be to the appropriate standards. So they'll effectively go into a property for a new build company who are saying, right, the minimum standards of the building regs is to fit two detectors. And there's a contract for working to the, the standards, which is to fit four detectors. Mm. So, they, you know, they do it a bit of an issue sometimes where the contract is basically out of pocket because he's working to the standards for the builders saying, well, I only need to fit two detectors to get yeah. signed off. So we, we work, you know, we keep talking about this disparity and, and, and sorting this out. But in terms of the British standards, it's prescriptive. Okay. You know, this is, you know, as, an, as, a, as a professional working within the industry, you're expected to follow the standards and you're putting yourself in a position, uh, a tenuous position, if you're not working to the standards. It's like the electrician trying to put something against the 7671 standards, you know, he's, he's going to end up in a, if there's ever a problem, he's going to fall, he, he's the one responsible for it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with fire detection. If you're responsible for properties, and you're putting tenants into those properties, you need to provide them with reasonable protection and, you know, make an informed decision as to what to do. Um, unfortunately, the, the private landlords legislation came out in 2018, which were effectively to force private landlords to put fire detection in properties. However, they set a very, very low bar in terms of what to fit. Basically, all they said were you need to fit a smoke alarm per floor in a property. But the, the point is, you, you've got something on your ceiling what's protecting your life for the next 10 years. Yeah. So effectively, the Scottish government said to everyone, regardless of tenure, so landlords, social landlords, and owner occupiers, you've got to have a minimum standard of smoke detection in your property by February, as was February 2020. Okay. Um, so basically, they, they, they put a law in place. Yeah, I don't think it was necessarily sort of advertised enough. Um, so, you know, we as a, uh, as a responsible company, but also as a commercial entity, basically to respond ourselves to make sure that people in Scotland knew that they needed to have a smoke alarm in their property by the end of 2020. Uh, at which point, various people in government realised, you know, that it not necessarily been promoted as widely as it should have been. Yeah. Um, and people in the community were also saying, "We didn't know about this, and oh, we're in COVID. <laughs> you know, we we basically in the, you know midst pandemic now and." We need to try and get this sorted out. And it was just impossible. You know, too many people in the country needed to sort this out. So they effectively just extended extended the legislation, you know, which is something which is never done. You know, to the idea is we pass a law, it's in, you know, to, once that law's been passed, it's enshrined, enshrined, and it's, it's a nightmare to try and change it. But they effectively extended extended the, the period until 2020, mm-hmm. you know, until 20, sorry, we're 2021. So 2020, 2021, and they've extended it to this year to 2022, okay. basically. So by the end of February 2022, everybody in Scotland effectively should have working smoke alarms in their escape rooms, in the living room, and in the kitchen, and interconnected. That's the key part that they've got to be interconnected. So okay. it's not a case of ringing your fire service up and saying, "Can you come with a couple of extra smoke no. alarms so I meet the legislation?" They've got to be interconnected. Mm. It's uh, and it, and it has been a massive undertaking, but 
we've already seen it. You know, you look at the statistics we're out there now, and the the fatalities in Scotland from fire deaths are dropping. You know, there's still reported fires are still there, but you you're seeing this drop in fatalities, and all you can think is, well, so people are still starting fires, people are still probably buying the cheap charges and what causing fires, and they're still doing the same thing that they've always done, which is creating fires in the properties for <laughs> yeah. their reason. But they're becoming aware of it now, and they're getting out. So the, the fatalities are dropping. The fire statistics are still fairly high, um, but the fatalities are dropping. And that, I think that's know, where our focus to... needs to be, because also I think people are more distracted than they ever have been now you know <laughs> we, we could argue we're better educated and we could argue uh, we've got much better access to resources you know most people have access to a, a digital device of some form their mobile phone usually gives them access to all the information that they're ever going to need but it also brings with it a hell of a lot of distraction so we're almost whilst we're stepping forward and making a lot of uh, gains and progress with safer communities and, and trying to empower people with the knowledge we're also burning into or, or they're running out of that attention. You know, people say time and stuff is, is a finite, and it is, but more than anything else, it's their attention. You're know, trying to hold and engage people. Um, and when you find that exhibiting itself in the home, it's a distraction with, with te- television, with mobile devices, and that is where you know, a lot of this occurs. It's not because people are stupid. It's not because people don't care. It's not because they're, they're, they're maliciously trying to hurt themselves or others. It's often just because they're distracted. You see in the streets, you know, literally everybody's looking at the phone now in the streets. It's constant. So I'm surprised road traffic accidents with, you know, pedestrians haven't, haven't risen as much as it has done, to be honest, because, you know, you just, it's that, it's that distraction. And I think we, so we, we, we've seen the fires, but we're just not, we, we've seen a drop off. And I, I just think if we saw the, it's the same drop off in, in, in England, how many more people wouldn't be dying in fires? Um, but when you're having conversations with people, with, with, with installers about stuff, you know, I'm quite happy to talk about what the fire rescue service are doing. But one of the key things, I think, one of the really good things about the on fire safety checks is, is, is escape. Mm. You know, not enough people. You know, they fit in small clubs, but they're not thinking about how they're actually going to get out of the property if there is a fire. You know, it's, it's a, and it's a massive thing. I mean, you know, I look at my house, you know, I looked at my house at the time and when, when it first became apparent to me about this, and I've not really thought about it myself. Mm. And basically, we've got window locks. Everybody, you know, everybody's got locking windows now. If they've got, you know, if they've got fairly, you know, modern, I say in the last twenty years, modern, I suppose most yeah. people have got locks on windows. But do they actually know where the key is for that, for those windows? You know, and we didn't. You know, I mean, I basically looked around the house and thought, how, how am I going to get out of the, you know, the kids' bedroom window if? That's what happens because generally speaking, you probably get your family together and go to the kids' bedroom and then get out from there. Mm. You know, make sure that you, you know, everyone's safe before you start looking for your escape. And didn't know what, you know, we've locked the kids' window because it's safe but to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but then we don't know where the key is to open it, and it's double glazed. It's probably going to take a hell of a hit to try and smash it. Oh god, yeah. So basically, where's the key? And the wife said, "Oh yeah, it's in the pot downstairs. I've got them all in the little pot downstairs." It's like. Well, because of that, if there's ever a fire, and <laughs> I think how many more people, must be, you know, must be in that situation where they have no idea how they're going to open. Well, they probably do know how they're going to open the windows, but they've got the key in a place that's not going to be accessible yeah. in the event of a fire. And people, need, you know, should think about this, and also consider the fact that the kids won't wake up from smoke alarm. Yeah. You know, it, you know, I'm on the fence as regards whether or not they should wake up from smoke alarms because I think in all cases there should be a responsible adult in the house anyway Mm. and the idea of a three year old waking up from a smoke alarm and then going running off around the house when ideally you want to know that they're in bed and you can get to them as soon as the alarms go off you go there and they're going to be in bed where you expect them to be to help them get them out of the house so I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that we need to have something what ensures that kids do wake up from fire Mm. but it's, people should be aware that there is a chance that their children won't wake up. You know, the work what Dave Cost did down in Derby, uh, looking into it after the, uh, after the Philpott case. Um, a large proportion of children, when he asked his colleagues to go out and go on, I mean, he basically asked his colleagues to go, to go home at night and set off a smoke alarm directly above the kids' bed at three in the morning. You know, he didn't get the best response from his colleagues initially when he, when, when he asked them to do this because they all said, there's no way I'm waking up my five-year-old at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So he basically ended up having bets with them. You know, 
giving them some money and saying, look, if you know, if they do wake up, keep the money. If not, you know, bring the money back to me tomorrow. And the majority of them, I think, were nine out of ten of them came back and gave him the money. Really? Um, there were there were some there were some interesting insights from some of the work they did. One were that more kids did did wake up who had got younger siblings. Mm. So it's not about the actual physical ability to hear a smoke alarm. No, 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 it's not. You know, if you, it's whether it triggers you because you become it's a little bit like people that yeah. live next to a train line, or I mean, even when we're out on the roads now, people have become it's like white noise. People have become they don't respond to sirens that don't respond to alarms in the same way that they used to mm-hmm. and car alarms and house alarms are just going off and people it's just white noise people don't respond to it we can pull right up behind people with our two tones on and flashing blue lights and they don't even know we're there it's interesting you said that actually i was thinking that the other day about the ambulances you know the fact that we've seen out so many ambulances all you know every day i'll, I'll see an ambulance with blue lights on yeah. um not thought about it in that way, but you, yeah, it's probably true. But isn't there some the thing companies with, you know, that are that have a voice on some of their alarms? Mm-hmm. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, there's various ways. Yet, they, but that's that's an interesting one. Yeah, it's an in, it's an interesting interesting way to go. And I think you know, then you've start got to start thinking about all the people who've got English as a second language and uh, they're not. Yeah. So many implications with doing something like that. That you could end up making 30 different versions of it, which yeah. I just, you know, we, we, we know there's a tried and proven way of waking up adults in a fire. Um, but things other than that, I mean, I just wonder whether or not if someone were talking, if I got a small club one told, knowing what my, how, how loud my son has his TV, whether or not I'd even differentiate between the sound of somebody talking on the small club know. and TV, you know, his TV basically blaring away. Um, so I think there's always there's always some issues around around various looking at it various ways. I mean, some woman actually mentioned about you know why don't you just have a small alarm what sends a text message to a child because basically the phone buzzing will wake them up in the middle of the night. You know they, they're up all night looking at Instagram and various. Other, that is an the, unfortunate just, truth. Perhaps there's there's some yeah. validity to some of that. Yeah, it's horrendous. But basically, you know, there's still research happening. It's still it's ongoing research. And like I say, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence as to whether they need to be walking up in a fire anyway, to be honest. Mm. Because I like the idea. I, I would definitely have preferred the idea of having my kids in their beds where I expect them to be. Yeah. Um, if, you know. But like I said, you know, I think everybody's going to have an opinion on this. But the main thing is understanding that's what could happen in a fire. If you are if you know that's not, you know, the kids might not wake up in a fire, then put a small club in the bedroom. Yeah. You know, if the fire does start in their bedroom, you're going to know about it a lot quicker than waiting for it to spread through to the upstairs landing and, and, and trigger the alarms. I think, it, you know, I mean, I, as soon as I start working for ACO and saw some of the videos, you know, you get to see from clients and they show your houses, they show your bedrooms where basically just a, a laptop left on a bed but completely burnt out of the bedroom. Yeah. You know, it's just overheated. It's literally, you've got a fan on the side of a laptop what dissipates heat. Yeah. As soon as he goes onto a duvet, it's basically stopping that family. Yeah. It's you know, it's so all these little things you sort of mention when you're doing training um, to people. Like, have you thought about an escape room? Have you, you know, if you've got kids, have you got laptops? You know, we find that a lot just, with students as well. We find it with students mm. that work in, their, you know, obviously work in their bedrooms. They have small student yeah. accommodation and they're doing work while they're in bed, you know, and they're and they're yeah. away on the laptop and stuff like that. The amount of heat that gets built up around that and you, you, you see it, you know, the quick near misses when they've got scorch marks um, on the on the duvets and stuff like that. And yeah. luckily there's been detection in the corridor or perhaps even they've taken it upon themselves to put it in their own flats. But mm. yeah, it's common. Yeah, but it's just it's getting that knowledge out to people, like to the parents basically. Just have a chat with your kids and basically say, look, Whatever you do, don't leave your laptop open on your bed unattended because mm. this is what happens. Did you even know? You know, I mean, that's the half the time. You don't even know this is even a risk. No, no, just, they're yeah. just doing it. If you have that conversation, you're putting it in the mind. And the same with kids waking up, you know, waking up from smoke alarms is like, it may not happen. If you know about it, you know what you're going to do in the event of a fire. And always have an escape plan, you know, and make sure you have that conversation with your kids. You know, this is what's going to happen. If these alarms going off and we have a fire in the house, this is what we're going to do. Paul, that has been 
so insightful, my man, especially from the legislative perspective and stuff like that. Empowering, you spoke about empowerment there, empowering people with the knowledge of what they're exposed to, where they should be getting that help from, um, you know, what responsibility lies from within people in and around them already, you know, landlords, um, people building housing, but how they can also take those actions themselves, those small nuggets. And that's all you ever want. You know, it's just that yeah. little takeaway. But no, thanks for today. Appreciate it, mate. Good, right, to, mate. good to talk to you again. Good to speak to you. Take care of yourself and I'll see you soon. See you later, mate. Bye-bye.